Okay, Kathy. Well, good evening, everyone. And for those that are tuning in and joining us, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Warden Kathy Burkhart Jessen, Warden of Middlesex County, and I'm also the Mayor of Lucan Vidal. And joining me this evening for our first ever virtual Middlesex Roundtable is our CAO, Bill Rayburn. And I want to welcome all of you for taking the time out of this lovely spring evening to join us uh, live. Or if you play it back in the coming days, um, thank you for taking the time out of which, what I imagine are your busy schedules. Thank you for your interest in Middlesex. Bill, it looks like we might have a couple hundred um, joining us this evening. And from what I understand, they're joining us not only from the County of Middlesex, but from beyond our borders. So we're thrilled to have them uh, participate. And I know I'm looking forward to the casual conversation that we have planned. Certainly this platform um, has offered us up a great opportunity. And I wanna thank the panelists in advance for taking time to join us and just sit and talk about you know what's been on the horizon how they've been dealing with the situation that they find themselves in as i say it's a casual conversation and it's we're hoping that it will give you some insight into how our provincial decision makers are thinking um, as we are moving through and past this covid situation we find ourselves in bill have i missed anything or is there anything that you want to add before we get going um yeah the a couple things first of all we have to mention that we are recording this and um so that it will be again available on on youtube uh, after the event um the other thing that we should say is that there's a q a button down at the bottom and if you have questions for any of the panelists um then please um just push the q a button and we'll um, make sure that your questions get put towards the ministers if there's time permitting. And we're just uh, waiting for um, a few of the panelists to join us. I know that, oh, here comes um, Monty, Minister McNaughton, and we'll, I think I saw him there for a second. And here he comes. There he there is, are. the, fav the favourite son of Newberry. Monty, I was laughing earlier because I said to Kathy, whenever we first opened up the webinar, that there was 25 people that were right ready to go at, at 6.45. And I said to Kathy, those are all Monty's relatives down in Newberry that have clicked online already. Yeah, I, uh, sorry about that. I um, actually had trouble. I have two calendars and it was in, not the one that I normally use, so. Well, we're you glad you're okay? here. Well, you're you joined us. We, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think we're good. Go ahead, Kathy. Um, yeah, no. Um, Monty, I want to thank you um, for taking some time out of the out of your day to join us for a a, a chat. Um, for those of you, I'll just refresh everybody that uh, Monty is our member of parliament for Lambton Kent Middlesex and he's also the Minister of Labour. Um, and he's always a great champion of Middlesex and we're great to have him. We're, we're so thankful to have him as part of our what we consider to be part of our team. Um, just to start things off, um, Bill mentioned your family and um, your wife actually has a blog about being a political wife. And that provides a glimpse into your daily routine. How challenging has it been for you to balance the demands of being an elected official, particularly a cabinet minister? Um, because those responsibilities, of course, go beyond those of just an MPP. And you've got a young family. How are you balancing that? Well, it's a, a good question. Um, first off, thanks for um, inviting me to be here. And I know uh, Jeff Yurick and Steve Clark are, are joining us, my understanding as well, and, and possibly Ernie Hardiman. I'm not sure if, if he's on That's tonight, right, yeah. but yeah. thanks for doing this. And Kathy, Thanks, Kathy, for, for your leadership and 
we have uh, you know just a great relationship with with Middlesex County. We work very very closely together. I know Bill and I talk on a on a regular basis, as do um, all the mayors and and deputy mayors uh, and myself. Um, so you're right. My wife Kate does have a, a blog, Political uh, Wife Life, and uh, really she started this uh, a number of years ago um, to you know, really just work with some of the other MPPs spouses. Now I'm very fortunate, uh, and I know Jeff's in the same position now, but um, I've always had Kate in, in Toronto with me when I'm at Queens Park. So that's been uh, very, very helpful. I mean, as long as she has a computer, she can work. So I've been very fortunate that way. And it was an agreement that we had uh, when I got into politics, when I ran in, in 2011, that we were going to do this together. And then, of course, Annie was born in, in 2013, and uh, she's uh, six years old uh, now. Um, you know, probably like everyone else, the, the pandemic has just changed everything. So, you know, a lot of days I'm cooped up with my family uh, in the house. Thank God uh, Kate hasn't killed me yet. <laughs> but um, I, I try to get into the Strathroy office uh, a few mornings a week just to answer calls, to hear what people are saying, and then, uh, like, like the other uh, ministers that are on the phone tonight. Um, in the very beginning of COVID, we were doing cabinet meetings literally Monday to Saturday from four in the afternoon. And some of them were going till 1030 at night. Um, and having a young family in the house, there's a few disruptions. Sometimes, you know, the door would open and Annie would run in uh, behind me. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's a team effort as, as everybody on this call knows. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. That's great to hear. You know, actually, I saw a video that you shared earlier this week when you and Annie were putting together the um, the uh, garden, um, the, you know, the raised garden, garden boxes, I, the raised garden. I thought that was great. That was awesome. And it was a great picture of Annie with the with the with the drill in her hand. So, um, you know, it, it, it certainly is a balancing act. And um, uh, you know, I think you're doing a great job. That's for sure. So, keep up the great work with that. Thanks. With that, we got something to speaking ask of uh, great point. work, Monty. Yeah, speaking of great work, Monty, why don't you tell us a little bit about the recovery task force here on um, at Cabinet? Yes, it's uh, you know our our ministry, uh, the Ministry of Labor, Training, and Skills Development. Um, in the very beginning of this, uh, you know, we we were swamped as we you know started shutting down the economy um, but it actually pales in comparison to how busy the ministry is now um, with the reopening of the economy so i am sitting uh, with a number of the colleagues my colleagues on the phone tonight on the jobs and recovery committee um, really this committee is the one that laid out the framework for reopening the economy so there's three stages where we've already announced stage one the businesses uh in stage one are all uh, open now and we're working towards uh, opening stage two and in between each stage it's it's two to four weeks so we're one week into stage one essentially um, what what I've undertaken and in our ministry really they've worked 24 7 the last few weeks to prepare to begin to reopen businesses but we've created these guidelines for businesses and organizations uh, to follow in order to reopen their business. So there's about 95 of them right now. We'll probably end up at around 120 or 130, but they're essentially how-to guides for opening your small business or manufacturer, whatever the business is. Um, so it's, you know, it's lays out pretty sensible things. So, you know, how you physical distance in a, in a retail store, putting up plexiglass when, you have hand sanitizer in your pocket, all kinds of things. So it's, uh, you know, it's a big undertaking. Uh, as all of you on this call know, it's, uh, we're going through unprecedented times. As you're preparing for all that, what do you think the biggest challenge for your particular ministry is associated with the reopening of Ontario's businesses? Yeah, I mean, we're literally, uh, you know, I, I say to people, I'm, I'm barely treading water right now because it's, it's so busy in the ministry. I mean, we've got challenges because uh, there's a lot of places where only half the workforce is, is going to work right now. I mean, they're just, workers are afraid uh, in some cases. 
So that's why, you know, the health and safety is just so important uh, to keep workers safe, but also to build that confidence for workers to return. And then I guess, thirdly, on that point, we also need customers to go back into these businesses. So that's why the health and safety is just such a priority. Um, we have issues, uh, you know, under the current law in Ontario, and, and I'm going to address it very soon, but uh, after 13 weeks, every business is responsible for paying severance and termination pay. So there's one local restaurant that has uh, 30 employees. If the government doesn't move and, and support the small businesses, this restaurant owes $100,000 because their employees have been laid off for 13 weeks uh, during the COVID crisis, I mean, through no fault of their own. So there's all kinds of these, you know, labor issues, health and safety issues, and then of course, continuing to build these guidelines so businesses can reopen. You, get, you talk about it being unprecedented times and it, you know, things are changing so quickly and, and um, how do we manage through that? I was just wondering, you know, you come from a background of municipal government and um, we've got so many watching us tonight. I'm just wondering how um, your, your background and your experience working uh, in municipal government has prepared you um, for the role that you have now. Well, I, I mean, I, I'm so fortunate that I got to serve a few terms on municipal council uh, in Newbury. Uh, I mean, for me, it's always been about customer service and I know, I feel that every leader in Middlesex County has that same, uh, you know, that philosophy, that principle of, of looking after people. Um, so for me, that's what I learned uh, the most. And of course, being raised in a small business in Newbury, I mean, the customers watched me grow up and I've known, you know, I knew all of them my whole life too. Um, and it's just about, you know, answering that call when, when you're needed. And mm -hmm. I mean, in this role right now, I mean, who, none of us on this call would have ever dreamt that this would happen. Uh, but you just have to, uh, you know, you just have to answer that call and do what, um, do what you're asked. And I, I feel that I owe everything to my uh, three terms on, on municipal council. That's great. Speaking of uh, municipal leadership, Warden, um, we're joined now by the Minister of Municipal Affairs, who's uh, got a long, extensive history in municipal government. Minister, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Can you hear me okay? We hear you perfectly. Thank you. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thanks. I was How just listening it? to uh, yep. Minister McNaughton. He's doing such a great job. Yeah, he, he was. He is doing a great job. We, maybe we should ask you the same question. You know, how has your ministerial experience been guided by your municipal CIO experience? Well, you know, both uh, both my uh, uh, experience as a CIO and also prior to that, when I was uh, on council for three terms back when I was in my twenties, you know, it gave me a really interesting perspective of being on both sides of the council table and. Uh, you know, being a CAO is, uh, it, you know, I was talking to one of my local mayors tonight just before I called in and, uh, you know, it does give you a good experience. As, as a, you know, as a CAO, your council uh, relies on uh, administration to give them the best decisions, best information possible to make decisions. And, uh, you know, I, I can't say enough about the, uh, the people that I got to work with at the township of Leeds in the Thousand Islands before I was elected an MPP in, in 2010. And then, you know, from 82 to 91, you know, I basically for half of my nine years on council, I did it full time. You know, I was a 22 year old. I was making, uh, you know, $14,000 a year. It was like I died and gone to heaven, right? So I uh, spent, you know, uh, 40 hours a week at City Hall and at committee meetings, plus, 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 as you all know. And uh, it was a really rewarding experience. So to be Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing was, was really like a dream come true for me. That's fantastic. Minister Clark, I had the opportunity to meet you, I guess, back in January, it seems so long ago, at a Western Ontario Warden's Caucus meeting, and I gave you a letter that uh, we wrote to you, um, you know, talking about the municipal modernization funding. And it is no secret, um, I am a huge fan of this program and my counterparts around uh, the County Horseshoe and then with all of our municipalities. We have seen such great benefit from this program. And I guess I've got a couple of questions. Where did that idea come from? And has there been any talk about expanding that to other ministries? 
Yeah, no, I, I, it's a great question. You know, it started, uh, you know, when we started to consult um, on uh, the regional government review, I had, I had appointed two advisors, but myself and, and my cabinet colleagues were out talking, uh, obviously on the regional side, and people were asking a variety of questions. Are you gonna do it uh, uh, at the county level? And, and you know, what, what aspects are? And then it became a consensus that really, um, you know, municipalities can, can look at those efficiencies because that was really the three, the three things we looked at, you know, service delivery, governance and decision making and service delivery was one of the, the biggest things. And there was an incredible appetite out there, you know, whether you were in a county or a region, whether you were a single tier, it didn't matter whether you're in southwestern Ontario, eastern, northern Ontario, everyone wanted to look uh, and do line by line reviews and to try to do things more collaboratively, do things more cooperatively, think outside the box, deliver services uh, differently. And really, uh, uh, you know, as we move through COVID-19, that's really had to happen. You know, you, you look at, you know, the, the bill that I had passed uh, that allowed you to do electronic meetings, you know, that, that would have taken an incredible amount of consultation and discussion and and negotiation to get forward. But, you know, COVID-19, you know, it was a new reality for us. So we had to look at, uh, at, at accessing meetings and decision-making in a different way. And I think moving forward, uh, funds like the Audit and Accountability Fund for large urban municipalities and the Municipal Modernization Fund are gonna be even more critical uh, for the success of municipalities. We, you know, we are not gonna deliver services the same way. we are going to have to listen to uh, the new reality uh, moving forward. So uh, I'm glad you're a big fan of the Municipal Modernization Fund. So am I. I'm back. Oh, he's back. Yep, there you are. Minister, uh, yeah, we are big fans of the <laughs> Yeah, we'll talk about that later with Mr. That. Mr. Hardiman. I got that, I got that brought we, um, everybody else. <laughs> we, um, we're big fans of the changes that you made for the emergency provisions. I wonder as well whether you think that um, it's been a great experiment for us because we've been able to learn whether or not these provisions, legislative relief that you provide us with social services and how we do uh, our meetings and how we do planning meetings, how we do planning administration, um, this has been a real lesson for us in how a county of our size can be more efficient and effective using the tools that you gave us during the emergency provisions. What are the potent, what's the potential that those might be around past the, uh, the emergency? I think most municipalities would like to see them uh, continue. Uh, I think, I think we, we need to, again, have a bit of a legislative fix for that. But over and over again, we've had municipalities, and I'm not sure what, uh, what the county uh, has experienced, but we've had uh, actual increase in participation because people are home, mm -hmm. they want to know what's going on, yeah. uh, people's YouTube channels, their, their Zoom uh, meetings have had incredibly better public participation than normally in the council chamber when you have a couple of council watchers uh, that come and, and you know, look at what you're doing. So I think it provides us an incredible opportunity to touch many, many more citizens. And we've always talked about this. We talk about it during election time. How are we going to engage uh, citizens to get interested in the, the municipal level of government? Well, you know, COVID-19, again, <clears throat> with, with these opportunities, has created more public participation. So personally, I'd like to see them remain in some way, shape, or form. And we're going to be looking at experiences that you've, you've had uh, to help inform our decisions. And you've been a leader. You've, you've, you've really been a leader in that electronic meeting provision. So. I think we can ask Monty a question I, I, now. I, I was just going to say, I think maybe I will pivot over to uh, Minister McNaughton and hopefully Mr. Clark or Minister Clark can uh, rejoin us. But, you know, it, it's um, Minister Clark referenced it and you re referenced it when we spoke a few minutes ago about working from home. And I just wondered, have, have there been any challenges that you've um, observed with regards to working from home? And have you heard from uh, some of your counterparts or from those that you're dealing with in, in, in the labor area? 
and and how would you address them i guess the follow-up yeah i mean uh you know i really am probably like everyone else on this call it's uh you know it's it's challenging working from home um i mean there's there's pluses too of course because you're you're near your family um as i said we have a you know a six-year-old at home so it's uh that, that can be a, a plus and a minus sometimes um so i, I guess my day i mean i, I started early in the morning we have a, a team call with my uh staff and my constituency offices plus um our, our staff at the legislature and in the ministry uh usually around 7 or 7 30 every morning and um a few days a week i go to my office in strathroy to handle calls from from local people uh tons of questions coming in i would say 90 percent of all the calls we get are uh, covid related and then um you know once or twice a week i'm i, I go down to toronto to do a press conference with with premier ford and uh, that's that's basically my week so it's either home constituency office or or in toronto uh, doing a press conference and a bit of time at the ministry office but um you know thankfully i'm you know i'm in strathroy Caradoc. we have a uh, high speed internet i know that's uh, a big big challenge especially on the education front uh right now and i hopefully uh we'll we'll talk about that later i mean every uh every high school by September we'll have a high speed in every elementary school by September 2021 but I believe uh, in Middlesex we're we're very fortunate because I think the uh, elementary schools are all going to have a high speed by this September actually mm -hmm. that's good news mm -hmm. Well, I know we, Bill and I put questions together, but I know some of um, our attendees have um, posed a couple questions. Bill, do you have one to ask from one of our Oh yeah, that's viewers? a good idea. We have, we have a good question here, Minister McNaughton. One of the questions is, does it concern you that some businesses aren't having employees wear face masks than other uh, businesses are? And what does the requirement or the potential use of face masks um, in businesses mean if there isn't PPE available long term? Yeah, look, it's been uh, a challenge getting PPE, as uh, everyone knows. Um, I, I will say I think this will be one of the best outcomes of COVID-19. I mean, we've learned that we need to manufacture this stuff uh, right here uh, in Ontario. We should not be, um, you know, relying on on foreign countries for uh, PPE. Um, our companies are ramping up. It is going to take time. But for example, the Woodbridge Group uh, out of the Vaughan area is going to be producing millions of masks. So that's, that's great news. It's just going to take a bit of time to uh, ramp up. Um, the guidelines we issued, uh, you're right, they don't, as of right now, call for uh, face masks. Um, we continue to take the advice of the, the Chief Medical Officer uh, of Health, but there's you know a number of initiatives that businesses can do to keep their uh, workers safe. I've talked about the plexiglass, um, you know, the hand sanitizer in manufacturing plants, for example. Um, they're going to this system where people's footwear actually dips in uh, a sanitizer to clean the boots, for example. So there's lots of sensible things uh, being done, but ultimately people just have to continue to physical distance themselves from one another. Thank you, uh, Kathy. We have another question here that maybe Minister Clark could tackle from the audience. And it, it relates to um, the opening of municipal buildings and whether or not the province plans to provide guidance and support to municipalities as they turn their attention to reopening, and also whether or not ca around the cabinet table there's thoughts about the province starting reopening in, in different stages depending on um, the the challenges that we see with the with the pandemic in different parts of the province. Yeah, and, and that's a great question. Minister McNaughton talked about it at the start of the call, uh, about uh, some of the labor piece that, uh, that his, uh, some of the guidelines that the Ministry of Labor has set out. I, I think those are some of the best documents that we've got and every uh, municipality that I speak to that's in some stage of, of reopening, 
I always uh, put uh, put that as a suggestion forward. You know, I you know uh, we're we're still working. The premier is still working very diligently with the federal government on a, sort of a financial relief opportunity for municipalities. But you know, around the cabinet table, and especially as Minister McNaughton and I both know, and so and same with Minister Yurick and Minister Hardiman and 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 all of the cabinet members know that. Uh, there's an incredible discussion point around municipalities and and some want to open fast and some want to open slow and i think that's the whole challenge when you've got 444 municipalities one size doesn't fit all not every municipality is going to want to go at the same speed as the other but you know i think we as a province have to uh, give some underlying um, direction uh, and you know as minister uh, as the ministers on the call know I'm always uh, with municipalities. Give us the straight goods. Tell you know, tell us what you want us to do, and that's 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 what I always suggest that, that we give clear, direct uh, discussion points for municipalities to follow. Thank you. No, um, that that's great. I think that uh, since you've been the minister of municipal affairs, I think. Uh, everybody would agree how accessible you have been to us and um, I know in, in talking to my colleagues you always get a sense from your ministry that that we are being listened to and uh, you're taking our concerns very seriously so certainly I appreciate that and I know um, administration does as well so Monty before we say goodbye to you and welcome Minister Yurek um, I'm wondering you know you're a southwestern Ontario boy how will our provincial economy in southwestern Ontario retool to create new opportunities for our area? And you, you mentioned about you know manufacturing PPE, PPE here, and I'm a great one for that. You know when you're in crisis, there's opportunity, and I and I'm hoping that there will be people that will see the opportunity um, that's in front of them um, and for southwestern Ontario. But what do you see? I, I really do think there's going to be a lot of uh, opportunity. I think I think government's going to change. Uh, we're learning that uh, during the COVID-19 crisis. I mean, people are, in businesses are working from home. Uh, so I, I think, you know, technology is going to uh, change the way government operates. From a business perspective, I, I really think Made in Ontario is going to be, uh, you know, going to be a priority. I think it's going to be a competitive advantage. Uh, manufacturing uh, should ramp up um, on the PPE front. Yeah, we're seeing great, um, great things being done. I mean, I was at Boss Innovations in Dorchester uh, last week, and they're making uh, sh face shields for uh, the VON in southwestern Ontario. They've retooled and they're using uh, 3D printers to do that. So, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity, and I think, especially on the manufacturing side, uh, we're going to see. Um, a lot of just hope and, and ho opportunity for people here. Do you see as we um, um, reopen, um, you know, there's the question of the PPE, but what about testing employees as they come back to work? Do you see that? I know I think um, uh, the Premier mentioned about uh, random testing um, today in his uh, an, um, announcement in his press briefing, um, but just wondered what your thoughts were about um, testing in the labour market. Yeah, I, I mean, I I was on a call with uh, the largest um, uh, trade union uh, in the province, and they're actually going to be uh, doing testing of, of their employees going to construction sites. Um, look, I, I think it's, uh, you know, th this is going to come. Uh, you know, the Premier uh, was quite blunt today. He's uh, disappointed where we're at. I mean, we were, we were almost at 20,000 tests, and all of a sudden, uh, it, it dropped down. I know the long weekend, there weren't a lot of people volunteering to, to go get their tests done. I think that's part of the issue. And there's still a bit of a transportation issue to ship these tests uh, around uh, the province. But clearly, uh, we've got to step up and, and do more tests. Um, I, I will say just one more plug, uh, because we're going to be making, a, I think, what's going to be a great announcement tomorrow. Um, there's a lot of opportunity in southwestern Ontario for the skilled trades. And uh, tomorrow, we've got a, a great announcement on that to get more young people uh, into the trades. I see that as a huge opportunity for young people in particular in, in Southwestern Ontario and, and right across the province. 
Well, that is great. That's great news. We'll certainly all be watching for that. Um, we're going to say goodbye to you because we've got uh, your colleague, um, Jeff Urich, in the waiting room. But uh, once again, Monty, I just want to thank you for joining us, taking time um, to, you know, share your thoughts and, um, you know, give us some insight into what you've been going through in the last couple of months. So it's been great seeing you and um, hope that uh, we can see each other not so virtually the next time. That's great. Thanks for doing this and keep up the great work uh, to all the county's uh, leadership people. Thank you. Great. Minister Yurik, uh, thank you for joining us today. We uh, really appreciate your participation as well. Um, you're on the line here with um, Minister of Municipal Affairs, Steve Clark. And I wondered, a question for both of you right uh, off the bat, Minister Yurik, how are you adjusting to working from home and how is uh, How's life been in, in that type of environment for a minister in uh, the provincial government? Yeah, it's been, been quite interesting. Thank, and, and thanks very much for, for having us on tonight. I think this is a great opportunity for, for the county and uh, really appreciate being here. As you can see in my picture here, I'm now wedged against a window. Uh, it's the only plug. My, my iPad was dying. And in this room, the plug is right by the window. I'm wedged on the floor. So there's a change right there. I, you wouldn't see me on or very often at the legislature in my office uh, conducting a meeting. But um, I think it's been like everybody else. It was a time to adapt and, and really utilize technology to make things happen. Um, I, I've never used uh, video chat uh, previously, and it's unbelievable how much I use it every day, teleconferencing. And um, I'm actually affecting more people day-to-day uh, -day now via uh, online activities than I had been as one-on-one -on -one and people uh, throughout the riding in, in, in Toronto. Um, and, and as Monty mentioned earlier, it's, it's kind of nice to have the family not far from you uh, while you're working. And uh, my daughter's 16, not six. So uh, it's a little different issues we're dealing with, but uh, uh, it's just as fun that way. But, you know, I, I think uh, as, as Monty said, it, it's a new, a new way of doing things and I think we're adjusting well. And I, and I want to thank everybody out there because I feel uh, overall, I think Ontarians have really adopted well. Um, they've been following the guidelines from public health to try to keep uh, these uh, the disease numbers in check. And I think uh, pretty much in rural Ontario, uh, it's working really well. So, um, you know, as long as we keep working together, keep the Ontario spirit alive, uh, we're going to come out on top of this and we're going to be better than we were previously. Maybe I'll jump over to Minister Clark and just off of what um, we asked um, Jeff, what's your new normal um, like? Yeah. yeah, it's 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 much the same as uh, as Minister Yurick. Uh, you know, to, to think we've had as many cabinet meetings and 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 Treasury Board and other committee meetings remotely, where we've been scattered all all over the province, and the fact that that many of us, you know, I'm at my constituency office tonight just because I had meetings into the evening, but it's quite often that I'll do calls from, from my home as well. And as some of you know, my wife works for uh, the Leeds and Grenville County. So we have to do the, uh, the Zoom chat around uh, the home. So I, she might uh, get the dining room table office and I might get, uh, I might get relegated to, uh, to a bit of a man cave where I, where I might just uh, call in with audio so that, uh, you know, it's, you know <laughs> but but it, but you know all kidding aside it's you know it's it's incredible the way we've been able to connect with municipal officials and some of our ministry officials uh remotely and it really shows you that when as jeff said when when you know this pandemic hits us we we adapt and and we're able to adapt and work together you know i've i've been able to uh access a bunch of municipal services uh, you, you know where i live in brockville in a much different way than I than I than I have before, and and I find that that people now uh, have crave incredible amount of information online and want to access municipal information online. And and one of the things that I think is going to be challenging for us coming out of it, especially in municipalities, is what is going to be the new normal. What you know we, we're we're so we're so connected with our budget process and our service delivery process. What is uh, an arena's operating cost? and revenue and expenditure going to be next year you know what what you know what what are some of our public events 
that we would we would host as as councils how are people going to access those how how are some of the, the the fees and charges that we deliver you know how can we budget for something that there's there's so many unknowns and i think that's why we have to be so collaborative between the province and the federal government and the municipal government because so many different things are going to come forward and and we're, we're going to need to work together and communicate because what what happens in in my county uh you know might not happen in your county so it, it is going to have to be a real different i think the the virtual amo conference we're going to have this year it, it we're going to be surprised at how municipalities and and the public are going to crave information uh from all of us and i think we you know we're going to the test that that we're going to have to pass at some point is how how is this new transparency in information going to work for uh, our colleagues and you know you i'm sure there was a, a lot of chuckles tonight with my connection challenges uh, to the zoom call but it, you know that's a that's a real thing that jeff and i and all of you are going to have to deal with and 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 how are we going to be able to connect with each other in future and the the public expectation for different types of services is going to be far greater online online demand tremendous uh, it's going to be a tremendous demand out there that we all collectively, all of us uh, who are in politics, are going to have to deliver on. Yeah, right. absolutely, absolutely. Minister Yurik, yeah, Minister Yurik, I know that um, speaking of public expectations, there's a lot of talk in southwestern Ontario about what our new economy is going to look like. Can you just give us some insight into what you're talking about about? around the cabinet table about supporting people and jobs and supporting businesses uh, during the pandemic and after the pandemic into recovery. Yeah, well, thanks. I, I, you know, I think I, I'm, I'm proud of, uh, of Premier Ford and, and the rest of cabinet. They're right out of the gates uh, uh, to provide an initial uh, support for, for businesses, individuals, uh, uh, over $10 billion in, in tax deferrals for, for businesses. Uh, uh, and seven billion dollars was was put into uh, our healthcare system to fortify it to make sure we had the capacity throughout the entire province, make sure we had the proper ventilators, uh, room in the ICUs, uh, capacity in our in the, in the beds. Um, it, it's just been, I think, a, an amazing rollout to start. And and with regards to the tax deferrals, you know, businesses were able to um, defer paying provincial taxes uh, uh, for I believe up to six months. Uh, uh, we uh, worked on the global adjustment to uh, keep it from raising during this time period because of the decreased electricity use so that businesses uh, have, have some savings with their energy bills. Uh, individuals were, were given, uh, we got rid of the time of use pricing, so we gave them a flat rate to control costs. Um, we, we made sure we were participant. We tried to participate in all the federal programs coming out, so we were able to work with a commercial rent uh, support program uh, along with the feds to make sure um, you know people can, are able to help pay the rent on the commercial properties. There's there's still some bugs to be worked out on that, but it's coming along. Um, in, in general, for for seniors, uh, uh, Christine Elliott came out with a proposal that ensured that they weren't paying seniors weren't paying the extra dispensing fees at the pharmacies. And um, you, you know, there's been so much talked about around the table that I'm I'm excited for uh, where we go next as a cabinet post pandemic. Uh, Finance Minister Rod Phillips is, is heading up the Jobs and Recovery Committee and, and Peter Bethenthal uh, as well, uh, uh, working on transformation of government. So I think you're gonna see uh, each minister around the table is having their own tables of how do we support uh, the economy and what new ideas can come out and, and create jobs. Um, you know, as the Ministry of Environment, one of my tables I'm, I'm, I'm working on is clean tech. And I, I think clean tech and the environment uh, Ontario is a head start, but I think it's also an opportunity for rural and northern communities um, to participate. And it's not really an urban-centric uh, uh, business uh, idea to start up. I I went out to BC uh, earlier this year in in February and and got a look at their clean tech program, which is just amazing. It really helps a lot of startups. And and I know in southwestern Ontario, uh, the ingenuity we have down here, and I think. Uh, the, the ability we are able to create those those new types of businesses. I'm I'm really excited about the possibilities of of creating a, a clean tech uh, cluster down in southwestern Ontario, uh, moving post that, uh, pandemic. And you know, Minister Clark, uh, he he has his tables going on. Minister McNaughton and 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 all of them around the tables. I, I think we're going to have an exi exciting 
a support and recovery program for this province. And, uh, um, you know, uh, we're, we're months uh, away from the full implementation of that, but we're in phase one right now. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm really optimistic at this point. You asked me two months ago, I wasn't too optimistic, but today I, I, I'm pretty excited. Well, that's good because I think um, that's what's going to get us through all this is trying to keep that optimism, keep that positivity and, um, you know, keep pushing through and, and looking, looking forward to when we're past phase three and when we're in a full recovery mode. Minister Clark, I know that um, you've got limited time with us this evening and I want to thank you for that. But before I say goodbye to you, we did have one question from the audience directed to you. You mentioned the AMO conference. And um, one of the, you know, things that participants that, or the de delegates that uh, go to AMO look forward to are the delegations with ministers. Has there been any talk about how that will look and um, how we can be involved with something like that? Yeah, we've, we've, we've talked about that uh, with, with AMO, about having uh, virtual uh, delegation sessions. We just haven't... Uh, we haven't been able to communicate anything yet. We were still working with the AMO staff and, and ministry staff, but I, I believe that we're gonna have a great opportunity for a number of ministers to be not just speakers, but also to take uh, a variety of topics, both uh, sort of plenary and, and also uh, individual municipal delegations, typically like we, we used to. The, the, as Jeff and I sometimes say, the the 15 minute speed dating meetings that we have with municipalities. And I do hope that we're gonna be able to organize a really, really robust opportunity for municipalities to connect with us. Because, you know, while, while as Jeff said, we, we do Zoom calls and WebExes and teleconferences all day long, I, th I think we need to have some formal uh, process uh, for AMO that people are used to where you can make a delegation request, uh, you can identify uh, two or three or four issues and then have a really good discussion around them, uh, you know, using an, uh, an online platform like the one we're using tonight. So, so I, am, I am looking forward to putting uh, as much work from the ministry in to show municipalities that, uh, that even though we might not be in a, in a in a convention center in Ottawa, we can still have those uh, very detailed discussions on municipal issues and also give uh, myself and my colleagues the opportunity to solve some local problems. And I think that's that's really why people go to AMO. I've been you know, going to AMO for, you know, the, on and off for 35 years. And, and it's, a, it's a really, really good opportunity the only thing that I miss, will miss, and I think, again, this is something we have to work, is that inter exchange between municipalities. One of the biggest things I've been able to do when I was uh, on council or as a CAO is I was able to go to a conference, whether it be Roma or AMO or Good Roads, and I'm able to take an issue back to my community, you know, tailor make it to my community and be able to roll it out. And I think that's, that's going to be the sweet spot. How is AMO and the ministry going to work on on being able to do that so that you can get access to us but you can also get access uh, to yourselves and i think that's going to be uh that's that's going to be some effort that my ministry and i are going to put in from now until uh, until august well that's really good to hear because i know the conversations i've had with my colleagues that's exactly what we've said that's what we're going to miss is that you know that time to get to know people from beyond our borders and bringing back what they know um, to our community. So be looking forward to that. The uh, other thing that will be interesting if they can pull this off from a, a virtual standpoint is the bear pit and see how Nigel can um, manage that because that would be interesting. But yeah, anyways, that, 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 that's going to take something. That'll, that'll, exactly. that'll take, the, the bear pit will be a little different next year yeah. So yeah. this year. Well, I want to thank you, uh, Minister Clark, for joining us. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time. And, uh, you know, I know that everybody that's watching certainly appreciates um, the, what you've been able to share with us. And we look, here, look forward to working with you and hearing more from your ministry. Thank you. And, and I, I, likewise, I, I want to thank each and every one of you for the tremendous job that you've done. Municipal councils and staff and committees have done over and above the call of duty uh, over the last two months. And I think uh, just as your uh, constituents uh, really thank the way that you've been able to respond, we in the province thank, uh, thank you for all the work that you've done. So 
so keep up the great work and we hope to talk to you soon. Great. Thanks so very much. Bye-bye. Take Warden, care. Warden, we have uh, another friend of Middlesex County coming on the line, a really good friend that's a familiar yep. face to all of the past wardens, the wardens, and all the wardens of Western Ontario Wardens Caucus that are out there today. We have the chair of the Western Ontario Wardens Caucus, Jim McGinn from Huron County joining us, all the way to past wardens like Tom McLaughlin, all friends of yours, Ernie, and uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. It's, uh, it's a great opportunity to uh, have one of these. Um, there's been a lot of questions about the, uh, uh, the significance of, of this new environment we're living in, and I find it interesting. I tell people, this is, um, there was a time when I wouldn't have had time for this call this evening, and now it's the highlight of my day to have some people. <laughs> It's the highlight of our day to have you two with us, Ernie, so we appreciate that. Um, hey, you know, we've had a few little internet issues here today, uh, other than Minister Urich's uh, technical sitting on the floor issue, but we've had some broadband issues. You know, with this new pandemic uh, recovery that we're going through and the new reality that we live in, for education and public service delivery, as you know, in rural Ontario, broadband's really become a public service that's uh, mandatory it's a public work um what are your how many times a day do you get asked about broadband in rural government in rural ontario and how and uh what do you see as the next steps for broadband infrastructure expansion for first, western first, ontario answering the first the, the first question first um, obviously every time i have a discussion with anyone from the municipal government side uh, we hear about the need for expansion of broadband i think and um, the government couldn't be more supportive than, uh, than we are um, in making sure that happens. As Monty mentioned, we've learned that in this, um, in, in this pandemic, the need for it, when we're talking about education, making sure, and the Minister of Education spoke about it today, making sure that the, that the um, students across the province have equal access to education, whether it is live or whether it is virtual, they all have to have the same opportunities, and we have to make sure that we provide that. That's why we, we are looking at uh, making sure that we, we keep working on the SWIFT proposal that we will all be um, familiar with, which is the one in Southwestern Ontario. Um, obviously, we have three projects that are presently, uh, presently um, uh, being built uh, in uh, Norfolk, Wellington, and Lambton counties. And uh, we just, um, I guess, um, for the people from Oxford that might hear this, we just announced uh, the next one and that will be in Oxford County. So we're looking forward to that. So I won't have to come to my office every day uh, to do these um, things because I don't have the, uh, the broadband at home either. So um, I think it's, uh, it's a very important, important initiative that we, uh, we believe we need to take uh, to make sure we keep up with the times. I think uh, we all speak about uh, where we go from here after we're through the pandemic. I can assure you that we will still have some face-to-face -face meetings, but the, the world will be a different place as far as, as dealing with, with governments and, and the programs in government. We're looking right now with the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, we're looking at how much we can do um, in relationship to our customers, our, our, uh, our uh, uh, people in, in the rural communities directly on online as opposed to having people face to face to do that because it's a it's a much more efficient way and people don't have to take the time to uh, and to fill out forms they can go right on and get it all done after the chores are finished and so i think um, we're going to see a different environment and broadband will be a major part of that particularly in rural ontario um, Jeff, we've got a question from one of uh, our attendees, and they're wondering, the question is, parents have frequently commented on how working from home with children, it's just, it's not sustainable. And how, you know, I don't think anybody's questioning that uh, closing the schools for the year was the right decision. But what do you think childcare is going to look like um, over the summer? Um, and perhaps even schools in September. I wonder if you, um, I know that this isn't your ministry, but uh, one of our attendees was wondering if maybe you'd had a conversation with the Minister of Education, you might know uh, the direction they might be headed. Certainly, uh, thanks very much. Um, I, I've had numerous conversations with Minister Lecce on, uh, on uh, our education system uh, regarding uh, our, our rural folks dealing with the online teaching at this point, uh, but also with uh, our, our daycare system. 
uh, we as a government have set up an emergency daycare program uh, for essential workers to, we're of course, working through the municipalities to ensure that those uh, essential workers have access to the free daycare. Um, but going forward, uh, it, speaking with Minister Lecce, there's, there's a plan coming out during stage two, which will see the, the opening uh, up of, of some daycares under specific strict guidelines, capping numbers going forward. And, uh, and also during the summer, uh, Minister uh, Todd Smith has, has given the okay for, for day camps to go forward. Uh, we won't be doing overnight camps this year. Uh, uh, Chief Medical Officer of Health has, has deemed that uh, it's just not worth the chance with where we're at to, to give the go-ahead at this point. So we're, we're just planning on no overnight day camps, but, or camps, summer camps. But the day camps will be open, so that'll help alleviate some of the child care issues. But also with phase two, which, um, you know, hopefully it, it, it comes about in, in a few weeks, depending on how the numbers are. It might be two to four weeks, depending, as I said, the numbers. Uh, you'll see some opening up of the daycares with strict guidelines, which will, which will alleviate it. it. It's really, a, uh, in my mind, it's, it's a tough issue to deal with because it's so important, especially uh, for, for the, the, uh, the females out there who usually are, are the ones who have to deal with uh, organizing uh, the daycare and, and or if they're not able to get it, they're the ones that usually um, uh, stay home. So I think it's important for the economy as a whole and also to support uh, uh, the women in, in, in our regions is to get that daycare up and running and, and Minister Lecce does have a plan coming forward. It's just not until phase two. Well, I know that we'll all be anxiously uh, waiting for that and certainly statistics. I, I'm glad that you referenced, um, you know, the women because certainly statistics say that um, women have been hardest hit through all of this. So um, I know we'll be anxiously waiting for that sort of announcement. Um, Minister Hardiman, um, being the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, I know that there's a number of people watching this right now that are quite interested in in this. Um, you know, dividing up the tax pie continues to be controversial in rural Ontario. And as assessments swing from uh, back and forth and up and down, is the government at all considering adjusting tax ratios at the provincial level? Well, I, I think that's a, it's a very good question and it is one that I hear every year at the, we talked earlier about the AMO conference and the Romo conference, when we get delegations from rural municipalities in particular, it's about um, what can we do about the, the tax ratio for, for farmland as related to the uh, being 25% of the residential and not being able to, uh, to change that. And I think it's important to recognize that um, obviously from an agriculture point of view, that's why uh, it's there. It was years ago, it was decided that the amount of services that the farms used per for their assessment um, was helping or was uh, incre increasing the cost of food, and it was not actually um, helping helping the farmers or uh, the municipalities. So they they lowered the the um, the tax rate was residential the same in both places, and then the provincial government paid twenty or seventy five percent back to the municipalities. To, uh, uh, to cover the, um, or to, um, uh, to rebate for what they didn't get from the farmers. When we change that to making it 25% um, of the residential rate, um, it was it, the, um, the um, uh, support, municipal support program included the, the, the evening that out uh, going forward, it got enough to make up for the 75% that they weren't getting based on the, uh, at that time it was called the who does what program. And so, uh, but having seen it in the last few years where the, the um, in rural Ontario, residential property hasn't increased that much in value, but farmland has creased, increased dramatically. So if you put the same ratio or the same tax rate on it, the, um, property tax for all the residentials goes down and the farmland goes way up. So the farm land is paying a much greater proportion of the taxes um, of, of the municipal tax base uh, than they were before. So they, um, they can then go to the municipality and ask that to have a change. If the municipality wishes to do that, they can do that, but not all of them can afford to do that. And in a lot of cases it makes too much difference uh, to um, 
to the to the residential tax rate, so they don't want to do it. But the um, the only way we could change it was to to uh, make it totally separate from residential because if you if you do anything else if it's a percentage of residential the only thing that the way you can change it is to reduce the value of the property and say we're only going to charge it on a portion of the increase and so i think it's a it's something that really does need to be addressed at the local level but i think there's also some uh, an argument can be made on behalf of municipalities and the municipal tax uh, payers to say and um, if all our taxes are based on value, then why, when that value goes up that much, why shouldn't your taxes go up that much? The, the tax rate that everybody pays is never based on how many of the municipal services I'm using. It's based on what the value of the property in the municipality is. So I, there's, a, there's a, it's, it's a debate that we can have between the municipalities and, and the farmers and the residential payers, but I think it's a different debate in every municipality, and I don't think it would benefit any of us uh, to actually solve the problem or to change the, the numbers at the provincial level because it would have a major different impact from municipality to municipality. And I don't think that that debate's going away anytime soon. <laughs> no, no, exactly. It'll keep coming up, Madam Warden. <laughs> It'll keep coming up. Yes. Mm -hmm. Minister Yurik, I want to ask you a question about the people at uh, both ends of the economic spectrum. I, I want to give you a chance. I've heard you talk a little bit before about what the provincial government's doing for our most vulnerable communities, our citizens in our community, community. but I also want to have an understanding as well for our, our business community about whether or not there's going to be stimulus funding coming forward from the province of Ontario. So can you speak to both ends of that spectrum, please? Certainly, uh, you know, um, again, I, I was proud of, uh, uh, you know, the leadership of, of Minister of Finance and, and, and Minister Clark uh, about the, amount, the amounts of money they put out to help shore up municipalities, the service to the vulnerable. Uh, 200 million was uh, given out the province to, to shore up, uh, uh, you know, food banks and shelters, et cetera. Uh, 11 million was, was given out so that, uh, you know, uh, municipalities and, and nonprofits who set up uh, food delivery and supports for seniors staying at home. Uh, the, the the LEAP funding uh, eligibility for LEAP for the low uh, energy costs for, for people, low income folks uh, was, was increased. Um, so I think we've, we've covered a, a, a lot of the area to show up the supports already in our communities. And I think that shows uh, the various municipalities uh, uh, that I deal with in Middlesex, uh, Thames Centre in London, um, very much so have shored up their supports for the most vulnerable and I thank them very much for the hard work. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming uh, Mayor Warwick and, and Deputy Mayor Elliott are on the line and, and really appreciate working with them and what they're doing for their community. Um, you know, going, going down the road, uh, um, we will be looking at uh, uh, the, the regional uh, supports out there. I know Vic Fideli was revamping our Southwest uh, Fund and had, had just started that out, a development fund. Um, Minister of Finance brought out a uh, regional opportunities uh, a, a tax credit, investment tax credit. So up to $40,000 now, a business could get a tax credit if they were to uh, expand, re renovate, or restructure their business at this point. That's just helped to stir up the, the economy during the pandemic. But I think out of the jobs and recovery uh, uh, fund and working in conjunction with the federal government, I think you will see some stimulus programs uh, uh, to come out and follow. But uh, uh, they, they'd still be be in development. Great. Now, you know, the out in Alberta, the uh, meat processing issues have really uh, come to light. And, uh, you know, that's an industry uh, that has certainly been hit hard by COVID. I'm just wondering, um, and either one of you um, can take this one, but do you have any plans to look at ways of um, increasing help for meat processing um, for Ontario farmers? Well, I, I think um, I thank very much for that question. And it is obviously as part of our, uh, our food chain. Um, I represent the, uh, the only ministry that other than the health ministry that is, is an actually an essential service um, in its entirety that uh, because, because of the fact of how important food is and the, um, the meat, Part of that is is a very large part of it, 
Um, there are only, in Ontario, there are only uh, um, there are two major beef processing plants. In Alberta, there are two very large ones. And obviously the two in Alberta, they, they process 70% of all the beef in Canada. And so when one of them has to shut down for a couple of weeks, um, it, we have a, a glut of, uh, uh, of cattle that we can't get through the system. So we have um, farmers that can't get rid of their stock and we have consumers that can't find meat on the shelf because the middle part of our food chain has uh, is been disrupted. When the, the um, um, Cardhill plant in Alberta shut down uh, for uh, a week to, because they'd had a great number of, uh, and I, I mean a great number, I think it was four, almost 400 COVID cases um, at one point in one week. And so they shut down and cleaned the place all up and did the, what Monty suggested, which put all the plastics in and, and rebuilt the whole plant uh, to accommodate it. When they went to open up, in the first shift, 350 people didn't show up for work because they were nervous about going to work under those conditions. So we had a lot of work to do to make sure to get people to realize how important it is that they come into work and how much we appreciate that they're, that they're doing that. Um, having said that, for the farmers, obviously, if they can't ship the cattle, they have to feed cattle that are uh, more than ready. So everything they're putting into is costing them money, but they'll get no return for. And so we do have a, uh, under the Ag Recovery Program, we will be uh, putting a, um, what they call a set-aside program. So farmers that have cattle ready to ship can um, get paid based on the amount they spend on that food to hold them back so we get the flow evened out again and hopefully that will uh, help. We have the same problem in the pork, uh, in the pork situation. We, when a pork plant shuts down, we have barely enough uh, capacity um, Totally, we use a lot of capacity out of Quebec, uh, but we have barely enough with even with that. When one of them has to shut down again, we have pork that we don't know what to do with. So we will we have the same program under Ag Recovery, together with the federal government to help um, make sure we look after the uh, both of the, uh, the the farmers for that. Now that doesn't help with the the challenges that the farmers are looking for that we're working with the federal government on. Uh, on the uh, the egg stability program, which is to cover the cost when the total market drops down because we have too much for what they are putting through. They don't have to pay very much, but the farmer doesn't get very much. So we're working with the federal government. I hope in the next uh, uh, few weeks we'll get something from them. Um, the type of money it takes for that it's greater than the province can do. We have to work together with the federal government on it, and hopefully we can get that done in the very, uh, in the very near future. And like I say, that's, um, our job is to keep groceries on the store shelf and farmers uh, in business so they can create the product. Uh, but right now, the processing is the main, the leakest wink, le weakest link in the chain. And so we have to do, uh, we have to work on increasing that capacity and also, I think I would point out we've had some questions about um, where we go from here as we come out of COVID. The place of the sector that has the greatest potential for new investment and building our economy is the meat processing. Uh, and the, uh, the, in, in agriculture, totally, the food processing sector doesn't necessarily have to be meat. It could be the processing vegetables. It could be the, um, any, and the, the, the food manufacturers. But the food industry is the only one that keeps growing regardless of what's happened because if there's more people, there's more food needed. So there'll always be a need for the people who, uh, who prepare that food for us. So I think we're, we're, we're in line to be the, the ministry or the, the sector that has the greatest potential for the quickest growth. Um, and and uh, London is a great example with the new maple leaf plant going up there. Uh, that's because of um, centrally located for where all this production is taking place. And so that's where they built a new plant because that's going to be the, uh, the most profitable place to uh, do business. And we have to encourage more people to do that. Um, you know, certainly this uh, pandemic has certainly, I think, enlightened a number, uh, a number of us as to, you know, supply chains and, and how food processing works and the importance of all of the roles in that supply chain. So, um, you know, we'll be watching for 
more information on on how that support will come down. Um, Minister Eric, before we say goodbye to you, you know, we've talked a lot about rural broadband and, you know, the opportunity to meet like this. And um, I mean, this is something that we wouldn't have probably been able to do and set up um, to meet in person. But, you know, you've got a ministry that uh, has a lot of consultations and, and uh, gathers a lot of information. Just wondering, um, as, you, as you've worked through uh, this and what you're learning about remote service delivery, um, do you see opportunities uh, for your ministry to consider additional processes to allow for public consultation to happen in a virtual setting? Yeah, I, I do. I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really opened my eyes to uh, access for folks because not everybody has the time to drive into Toronto or, or my ministry has not the opportunity to visit every community to have a conversation. Uh, of course, we'd have to deal with the, the broadband access in, in parts of Ontario, but hopefully uh, under Ernie's guidance and Minister Scott will have that well under hand uh, soon to, to ensure we're building that support. But you know, I, I can totally see going forward with more consultations to the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks uh, via, via items like Zoom. Um, I was making a joke the other day on, on one of the cabinet committees that we have is uh, each time I go to that committee, it's a different in different uh, platform to go on, whether it's Zoom or TELUS Business, Microsoft, Windows. So hopefully during this process, we're test driving them all as a government. and We can select one that's probably the best uh, going forward. My other idea that I threw out there uh, to uh, uh, Minister Bethenfalvy and the Treasury Board is he's looking to re, re, revamp government, how it operates. I, I thought one of the better ideas for economic development for uh, rural uh, and northern Ontario is, is perhaps some of the, when we expand government, when it happens, and it always happens in Toronto, where we get those government positions, with the utilization of these types of technologies, there's no reason at all why we can't start hiring folks in rural and northern Ontario to give them a good paying government job and, and work via remotely if, if we're going to allow for remote, remote at home working. And I think that's a great way to help fortify our economies. And we do have downturns, whether it's the auto industry or food processing goes kaput. Um, those people that have the government jobs, God bless them, usually have a, a, a well-paying job that can continue to maintain some support in our economy. So uh, hopefully our government takes a good close look at that because I, I think uh, there's a wealth of talent out in our communities that are untapped because we don't live in Toronto. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the overlying theme that I'm getting as I'm speaking to uh, the two of you and, and the colleagues that we spoke to earlier, and it is that looking for opportunities. How can we work better? I mean, you know, I, I talk to Bill all the time about how the county really rose to the occasion. And from the outside, looking in, you know, business was maintained, it's seamless. Nobody would have realized that, you know, all of a sudden we, we, we all of our employees are working from home. Um, and, you know, we've been able to do that um, quite quickly. And again, it's that, um, you know, when you've got a challenge, it provides an opportunity. So um, I, I'm excited to hear um, what you've all said this evening. Um, I think there's a lot of promise ahead of, announcements to come forward and certainly I know um, myself and everybody that's been uh, watching uh, will certainly watch with anticipation as you roll out uh, new announcements and new initiatives because um, I think that uh, there's great hope that you'll jump on the opportunities that have been afforded to us through this crisis. Um, I want to thank both of you for joining us tonight. Um, we've gone over our time that we said that we would keep you on so I appreciate that. Um, but it's been great to have, have you with us and join us this evening. I know um, the attendees certainly appreciate hearing from you. And we certainly look forward to further discussions um, in the future. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thanks for your time. I appreciated great. it. And I just have to apologize if my dog kept attacking me. If you saw this black buff or heavy breathing <laughs> or my screen shaking. Uh, one, one of the other aspects of working at home. Yeah, that's, that's what makes it fun. Home. If, Thank if you I, very much. If, if I could just say, Madam Warden, that I, I think it's so important that we recognize we talked about and I uh, did it today with a, another group that, uh, that I was on the Zoom call with, um, the, the, the changes that we have made so far during the pandemic, um, how many of those can we keep after the pandemic because it's working better than it was? And I think that's, uh, and 
and the answer of course has to come from people like yourselves and we aren't going to come up with all the answers you are and hopefully you will keep us informed as to what you think we can do uh, to make us coming out of here better than we were going in well you can count on that minister hardeman i'm always good at telling people you know how to do things better so you can well, count thank on you that. very much madam warden and thank you bill thank you thanks a lot madam warden we want to switch gears now and um talk about what's happening at the federal level and we're we're pleased to be joined tonight by brock carlton brock uh, welcome and thanks for joining us oh thanks for the invitation it's uh, it's been an interesting discussion to listen to over the last hour or so yeah for those of you that don't know brock um, you've been at the head of fcm for a long time you've been working with fcm for over 25 years and i should start by congratulating you on your pending retirement i know uh you're looking forward to that as well but i, I couldn't think of a better person brock whenever i was thinking about who can bring us the federal perspective um you've really been at the forefront of that federal dialogue with municipalities and with the federal government for a long time and you know what are the biggest differences you've seen uh with fcm over the last 25 years in its relationship with the federal government well you know i was thinking about this earlier today <clears throat> excuse me um i remember a time you know a few years ago more than a few years ago actually that where fcm was described as a sleepy mayor's club and one federal, <laughs> one federal official described fcm to me as the mcdonald's of ngos so i don't, I don't I don't think we're described that way anymore. I think we've become one of the most influential organizations in the country. And there's really kind of three things that have supported that transition. One is we've got a much more united and engaged membership than we've ever had before. You know, think of it. If our membership is engaged, we can talk to the federal government in every single writing in Canada. So having that reach and that ability and having a membership that's engaged and ready to do that has really, really strengthened the organization. The second thing that I'm really proud of is, in particular, is that the culture inside the organization, the culture among staff has really grown to a highly collaborative place of very capable people and on a mission. You know, everybody in that organization has a sense of purpose that we're, we're on a mission to change the country by improving the support systems for municipal government and the resources for municipal government. But the third and the result of all of this is that the role of municipal government in the country is understood in a much more much clearer way than it used to be in a much more active way. And the federal government, I think, understands more than ever before. But if it, if it wants to get its program, its objectives to Canadians, it needs to, to work with the municipalities in ways that are very collaborative and, and uh, you know, in, a, in a real kind of partnership mode so that we can all work to improve the quality of life in, in communities by supporting municipal government. But there has been a sea change. Like no one calls us a sleepy mares club anymore. That's right. No, no, they don't. You know, we're fortunate um, that uh, Joanne Vander Hayden, mayor for Strathroy Caradoc, she sits around the horse show with me, and uh, she definitely doesn't call it a sleeping airs club. That's for sure. And uh, we're thrilled that uh, with her involvement and and the roles that she's taking on uh, with FCM, you might have touched on this um, coming out of that question. But you know, I'm wondering, Brock. Um, what do you think are the highest priority initiatives? Um, what do you think they'll be for FCM coming out of COVID? Well, the, the highest priority right now that, that drives the future is the, the operating budget deficits in municipal governments across the country because of the COVID crisis. Every single municipality in the country is delivering services, providing support to communities without the traditional revenue base. So whether it's you you don't get revenue fees or um, user fees from libraries and other programs that support municipal revenues. Your your property. A lot of people have deferred property taxes. Um, public transit systems are running. Garbage is being collected without that offsetting revenue source. So, for us, the biggest priority is this operating budget deficit. And even coming out of the COVID crisis, if municipalities aren't financially healthy, they're not going to be able to provide the community support that's needed to drive the recovery uh, from this current crisis. So this operating deficit, which we estimate between 10 to $15 billion in a six month period, this, this current six month period, is an absolute critical feature of the, the current work we're doing and the way forward. The second feature for us, and you talked a little bit about it earlier with the, the other minister was, with Hardeman, I think it is, um, was broadband. 
and, and universal broadband, rural access to, to broadband, so that um, the, the fundamental pillar of ac internet access is available not only to, to rural government, municipal governments, but to local businesses and communities that are that really rely on that kind of access as part of the economic foundations of uh, smaller communities. Um, and the third, the third for us is that there's a lot of money currently on the table through the different federal programs, and that money's got to move. That, got, that money's got to get into your hands as easily and as quickly as possible so that when we come out of the current state of affairs, you've got money in your hands with, with projects ready to go to drive an economic recovery. So those, those are kind of the three, the three pillars. We're talking to the feds generally about the role of municipal government in a stimulus rollout program that, like we did in 2008 in the economic, the economic action plan that Prime Minister Harper's government brought out. Most of our focus right now is on the operating budget deficit. We're doing a full court press on that. But you were keeping an eye on that, that uh, recovery stimulus discussion that's going to come more robustly in the near future. Is that what you think, Brock, that there will be a, a significant infrastructure investment by the federal government over the next little while, similar to what we've seen in the past? You, you see that for the fall or like what's your crystal ball say about that? Um, I mean, I think that's the, the tendency people are looking to that kind of stimulus. Um, it's hard to know because the federal coffers are so depleted in the, the managing the crises. But the traditional approach to economic recovery is, uh, is stimulus investments in infrastructure in particular because it creates jobs, generates local economic activity. So at some point, they're going to have to turn to that. And you know, we'll, be, we'll be ready for that um, when that time comes. Yeah. Well, I know I, I certainly those are the discussions that, you know, we're constantly having. That's what, of course, what we think is going to happen and fingers crossed that, um, you know, that'll be the next move. But as you say, you know, who knows where that's going to come from with the way that they have um, uh, addressed the issue uh, up until now with money. So yeah. That'll be a wait and see for sure, for sure. You know, you've seen so much in your time with FCM. Um, what, you know, what would you be most proud of what you did with FCM? Um, the three things I mentioned earlier, all, I all feel really proud of the unity of the sector, the, the culture of the organization, the sense of mission and the, the, uh, the role of municipalities in the country as it's now understood. But more, you know, specifically to your question, um, in 2019, the, the federal government gave two FCM almost about a billion dollars for programming related to federal program, federal, federal objectives around building retrofits, around greenhouse gas emission reduction, uh, a top up to the municipal asset management program. So that, that was a highlight, not only because the volume of the dollars that, that were, uh, were um, entrusted in FCM, but the fact that the federal government looked at a set of initiatives or a set of interests and priorities in its programs and thought the best way to deliver this isn't by creating another federal program, but by handing the money over to the municipal sector in the name of FCM and for the municipal sector to manage those resources in a way that delivers on the ground practical things for municipal government at the same time achieving federal object objectives around uh, social housing retrofits, building retrofits, greenhouse gas emission reduction, that, that kind of thing. That was an absolute watermark and it's, it's, it's a testament to the quality of the work that we do at FCM. It's a testament to the, re, the reality that municipal governments deliver and they deliver on their, their, their commitments. And it's a re testament to the reality of the confidence the federal government has in FCM as a management of significant resources. Um, and uh, we can deliver on expectations. So with that, the, when you think of- sorry. Go oh, ahead, Warden. No. Did you have a question from the? Did you, well, yeah, we did have a question from the audience, um, Brock. That I'm going to try to paraphrase, but um, I know you you do have conversations all the time with the federal government. Do they focus only on uh, programs related to infrastructure, or are they asking you questions more broadly about how municipalities and how um, stimulus can be provided to support other types of industries within our community besides just public infrastructure? Yeah, the, the conversation on, on stimulus, I mean, it's early days, the conversation tends to focus on the infrastructure, but in the broader dialogue we have with the federal government, there's a very robust conversation that goes on around social issues like housing, 
affordability and social housing and availability of social housing. Um, broadband access is a critical feature of the conversations we're having right now. Um, the, the transfer of resources generally to the municipal governments. So for example, the gas tax is a model that we always hold up as the, the gold standard of federal municipal relations and federal investments in municipal governments. So there's a broader range of conversations than just infrastructure. I mean, I, I remember a time early on in my days as CEO where it was about infrastructure. And I used to say, I'm not really the CEO of infrastructure, but it feels like it. And now it's a much broader conversation around a range of social issues, affordability issues, and uh, uh, as well as infrastructure and, and you know, wastewater management, that all that sort of stuff is part of the, the conversation because Municipal government does so much in this country to support the quality of life in communities. And, and uh, on the limited tax resources that you have at your disposal, there's an awful lot of pressure. So there's additional resources needed for a variety of things that you do. I want to circle back to something you said about, and, and it's funny because you just said about how our municipal dollars, you know, are responsible for so much. And, you know, you talked about which again has been an, an underlying theme through all the questions we've asked this today with with regards to broadband rural internet and all of that and you know i guess i i kind of have a feeling i know where you might be where your answer might be but you know what can we do to really lobby the feds i mean i i remember when i first became a member of county council and we you know were, we were being lobbied to put municipal dollars into broadband plans. And I really struggle with that because for me, that's not a, a municipal program. Um, yeah. It shouldn't be something that we deliver. It's telecommunications. And in my mind, the feds really need to take the lead on this. And what can we do to ensure that that investment is being made? So there's a few things. One, I, I mentioned off the top, the, the increased engagement of our membership in the work we do. So that's really important in two ways. One, it makes sure that we're on, folk, on, on target for the priorities that are important to you. And second, it helps you, it helps us, if you're engaging with your, in your political conversations with uh, your political representatives from Ottawa who are in your, in your, uh, in your, aisle, in your communities. Um, so there's that, that engagement is really important. The second thing that's really important is to help all of us understand very, very clearly where that line is between municipal responsibility and provincial or federal responsibility. Um, and this is where your engagement from you, your folks through Joanne and Vander Hayden is really helpful because she's really helpful at clarifying, no, 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 that's, that's not our thing. This is our thing. And so, and then we are, our job is to take that thing, whatever, you know, that municipal priority and transfer translate it into the conversation with the federal government about where their responsibility overlaps with your responsibilities and where their resources are the resources that are going to be needed to enable you to do what you need to do without using your resources for things that are not part of your original mandate and it's a real challenge you think of the the original intent of the property tax wasn't to fund libraries and and uh other other services that the property tax covers now it was about it was about property and and when you when you rely on property tax for as the high percentage of your resources that you do it's pretty tough yeah absolutely yeah. rock i know in middlesex county we certainly appreciated the municipal asset management program and the funding i think was really well timed and much appreciated from uh, all kinds of small and medium-sized municipalities across canada is FCM considering any other grant programs in the near future to assist with pandemic recovery efforts? Yeah, it, it's, I mean, first of all, you have to recognize that any of those grant programs are supported by financial resources outside of our, our dollar, our membership dollars, because our membership dollars couldn't possibly cover that kind of programming. So any the municipal asset management program, the Green Municipal Fund, any of these, these programs that grant dollars, and by the way, we've, we've put about a billion dollars into the hands of municipal governments through these granting programs since the year 2000. Um, they all rely on the conversation largely with the feds. There's an interesting new program that we've just launched with the Canadian Medical Association Foundation, where they have put up $10 million and partnered with us to provide, my, provide money into the hands of uh, some homeless shelters, et cetera, during the COVID 
uh, crises. So we're looking for those additional resources that we can leverage to provide resources directly into your hands to do what you need to do. In terms of going forward, um, you may know we just we just launched a new um, tranche of money for $60 million for an ongoing municipal asset management program delivery. So that's kind of moving forward. Um, we will be talking to the feds about a variety of things related to post-COVID life. And we now have the capacity and the demonstrated capacity to talk to them about granting programs as a feature of our work going forward. There's nothing particularly specific in the conversations at this point, um, but you could imagine leveraging the Green Municipal Fund for greater resources to drive environmental innovation in a post-COVID world. Um, you could imagine uh, other programs like the, the Municipal Asset Management Program tailored to specific needs that you have, whether it's rural Canada issues or city issues. But there's nothing specific in the hopper at the moment that I can that, that we can that we talk about. Brock, I really want to thank you for your time that you've shared with us this evening. Um, I'm hoping that uh, our viewers um, got to know a little bit more about the FCM and the work that's done there. Before we say goodbye, I'm just wondering, as you're entering your retirement, if there's one project on the horizon that you wish that you could have been involved in. That you're yeah, not working, going with, to. working with Joanne Vander Hayden when she becomes president. <laughs> that is the perfect answer. <laughs> there you go. No, I mean, I mean one vote right there. <laughs> the, the reality is, you know, as I mentioned, the, the billion dollars in, in 2019 federal budget. So we're just now starting to launch those programs just in the last month or so. So there's a whole set of initiatives and impacts and and support for municipal government through those programs that I am extremely proud of, but won't be around to actually see them come to fruition. And, and that's, uh, you know, that's, but I won't be far away. I, Carol, the, the new CEO and I are good friends. And she's worked at FCM for 10 years. So she's, she's been part of the building of what we have now and, and we'll continue, I'll be continuing to support her um, from a different capacity as we go forward. So thank you. Well, that's great. And we certainly, as I say, thank you for your time, but more importantly, we wish you well in your retirement. And uh, we hope that uh, your days are filled with, you know, sunshine and all the things that you want to do and take on during retirement. Well, Thanks, thank Brian. you. And, and, and I have to thank all the members across the country who've supported me and FCM over the years. And it's really been a, an important partnership and relationship that's driven some significant change in this country that we're all really proud of. Great. Great. Thanks Thank very you. much for joining us. Thanks yeah. Much. Yeah. Thank you. Well, Bill, looks like this has brought us to the end of our evening, our Thursday evening roundtable. Um, I had fun. I think it was a good discussion. Got to know our uh, members of Parliament and our ministers that we work with uh, a little bit better. It was great having a casual conversation with them. Yeah, I really enjoyed it too. And I Thank you to all the people that were behind the scenes at the minister's office and um, they're all out there watching i'm yep. sure and uh, thank you to our western ontario wardens caucus colleagues for joining us and uh, we hope that we provided a little bit insight that will help you um, be the great municipal leaders you are coming out of this challenge and uh, we hope to do this again soon we i do apologize we didn't get to all the questions um, but uh, this is round table number one for 2020. So I'm sure that there'll be other ones and we'll get those questions answered for you. Yeah, I certainly, um, I think both you and I have said we enjoy uh, working on this platform and we see great opportunities. And I think, um, you know, for the, the rest of my term as warden, I'll certainly be looking for, for more opportunities to have these sort of discussions and, and bring people in. And um, as, I, as you say, there'll be opportunity, I hope, in the future to have those questions that didn't get answered, answered. So I wanna thank everybody that is either watching us live tonight or um, will watch on a replay. Again, your interest in Middlesex County. And really, when you think about the discussions that we've had this evening, the province of Ontario really are important. And we appreciate the time and the effort put in, in, in it. And as Bill said, um, there's a lot of people that have made this happen behind the scenes, not only from a county standpoint, but from the uh, minister's office. So thanks to everybody for making that happen. And and once again, I still have to find a way to get rid of my pens, but maybe in my thank you notes, I'll send a pen, pen along. All right. 
Sounds great. Thanks, everybody. Great. Have a great night. Thanks very much. Good night.